Okay. I'm going to ask you just to, uh, this is Wednesday night, and we're going to have a message uh, in a few minutes. But um, how many of you are at times very concerned about the, the, the condition of the world, uh, the United States government, the condition of life, the public schools? How many of you are concerned about your own life? How about that one? My finances, my relationships. Uh, how many of you are burdened or worried in life because of what is happening in your life? Okay. Um, I want you to convert that into prayer. And just tur turn to one portion with me, Philippians. Four, verse 4, this is not the message, but introduces, I'd like to have a few minutes of prayer tonight uh, before we preach. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How often? Always. Good times, bad times, how much do we rejoice? Always in the Lord, right? In the Lord. Verse 4. Verse 5, let your moderation, that word means your, your judicial balance, uh, what is right, um, the sense of, of being correct, but not legalistically, be known unto all men, the right balance in life. Verse 6, be careful for nothing, anxious is the word, be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Now notice something. There was a king in Rome, Rome, Roman Empire, king, ordered for taxes to be levied on the whole empire. And in Israel, you had to go back to your birthplace. So Joseph and Mary, during her pregnancy, they had to go back to Bethlehem. Who was in that? God was in that. God wanted the Messiah to be born in Bethlehem. Who made the order? The government, the king. He made the order. God had his plan. The prophet Zechariah said that the field of blood would be bought with 30 pieces of silver. Uh, 700 years later, when Judas Iscariot threw the 30 pieces of silver into the temple court to get rid of the money, the priests took the money, and what did they decide? To buy a field, and it became known as a field of blood. Who, who threw the money? Judas, who bought the field? The priests, why, it was God's plan. God was in it. It fulfilled the prophecy. He did it. It was God's plan. In other words, God doesn't need us to worry, but he needs us to pray. Last illustration. It's a dark time in Israel. Eli, the priest, has two sons, and they, they know not the Lord. And it means, in the Hebrew, they didn't care at all about God. He had two sons, and they had no interest in God. They were the sons of Eli. And in that dark time in Israeli history, there was a woman who had no children. She could not have bare children. But what did she do? Prayed. And God gave her a son, and his name was Samuel, and how important was he? But he brought in order and he established a school, and then he anointed the king Saul, and then he also anointed the king David. In other words, in dark times, God uses prayer. In dark times, he answers prayer in his timing. And he, he is saying here in verse 6, 
don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer. Because by prayer, a little baby was born that changed history. By prayer, the church was moving in the book of Acts. By prayer, uh, Dr. Stevens up in Maine had early morning prayer meetings. 5.30 in the morning It was like incredibly early. And um, you would get there in the dark. And we had prayer and we ended up going into parts of the world because uh, prayer is powerful. Verse 6 says, don't you leave your worry and ask, say amen and walk away from your worry. Don't even bring the worry into my courts or into my presence. Enter my courts with praise and gates with thanksgiving. And make your prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, should keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'd like you to take a few minutes of prayer. I want you to pray for convention. I want you to pray for the visitors coming. I want you to pray for the, I had a thought, that our, our in knowledge would not exceed our enthusiasm. Let me repeat it. Our knowledge would be linked to our enthusiasm, our passion. For a greater grace pastors worldwide and all pastors everywhere. And also for a baby to be born, even in a dark hour, that becomes with God's hand on that child. Maybe they are in our school. Maybe they are in the nursery tonight. For the next generation and the next one in God's plan, make your requests known to me. Ask of me. I will give you the heathen. And leave your trouble and look unto me and listen to me and ask and ask and believe me and say amen and receive the answer to your prayer. It, it's, uh, it's, it's powerful, and uh, prayer is powerful, okay? So uh, would you do that for a few minutes tonight? Make your request to the Lord.
Father, we are just before you in faith. And we know you are leading us in your Holy Spirit to drink the Holy Spirit, the anointing, the utterances, and you, you challenge us in our hearts to believe you. Yes, Lord. The natural man says, no, it can't happen. And then you say, ask me, trust me. The natural man is so troubled and confused in his soul, and he doesn't know how to listen. But you say, hear, and you shall receive, hear, and it shall be given to you. We are hearing, Father. We, we are hearers. We are believers. Thank you for your love, that you love us. Thank you, God. We are on holy ground. We are in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. We ask you to speak to our hearts tonight. Lead us in the faith embracing truth in the inner man, rebuking the enemy, resisting the devil, embracing what you have to say, walking from faith to faith, binding the enemy and its bound, releasing heaven and its released. And you said, pray, pray that, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would show us who we are, that's what we're learning. We, we are, we know who we are in you, and we believe it and embrace it. We are embracing it. We're living by it. Who we are. Yes, God, who we are. And um, heal, Lord. Uh, minister. Show us in the next six months, the year, two years, that we would be a mighty people, a, gr a great people, because of your greatness, and do great things in each life, and teaching us and leading us in Christ's name, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles, please, to Job. And... Uh, I'm sorry, Job. Um, <laughs> Job, it's a very important chapter, 19. Job 19. Don't be disconnected. Don't be disconnected. This is what we want to share tonight. <clears throat> uh, connections with people are spiritual, also natural, family, friends, where I work, what I do, connections are a big part of life. Who are you connected with? No man is an island. We're all connected somehow to different people. But in Job 19, Job feels the alienation, the loneliness, and sense of being forsaken. Many, many of us know this portion in chapter 19, and we, we will look at, at, a, at a starting verse, verse 12. But we won't read that now. We'll read it after we read the portion you're familiar with, which is starting in verse 23. So we'll read 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Oh, that my words were written, now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. They were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. He's saying, now 
he has something that he wishes it could be written in stone because it's important. He is saying, I have something I understand. I wish it was written and engraved in stone. Well, Job, we can say to you that it was better than that, but it's written in the Bible, your words. And these were the words, verse 24, that they were graven, verse 25, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Those words, that's what he wanted to be written in stone. My Redeemer liveth. That's what I would like everybody to know forever and ever and ever and ever because um, the stone doesn't wear out. But I wish that everybody knew this and it was always talked about. I wish it was clear to everybody that I know my Redeemer liveth and he shall stand at the latter day upon this earth, our Redeemer, in the latter day. That's when Jesus comes back. He will stand upon the earth. Job knew that. Now, the context is, is what I'm interested in sharing tonight. He said it when he knew something else in his life, and that was he had no connection with people. He had no connection. There was nobody that understood him. There was nobody loving him. There was nobody caring about him. He's at the bottom. He's desolate. He's forsaken. He's alienated. And there's nobody. And he gives the list. And it starts verse 12. His troops came together, raised up their way against me. They encamp round about my tabernacle. He has put my brethren far from me. My acquaintance are estranged from me. Verse 14, my kinsfolk have failed. My familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in my house and my maids count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. What he's saying is, nobody cares about me anymore. I'm outside, I'm forsaken, nobody's talking to me, nobody cares about me, and nobody's loving me. It was in this environment where, where God showed him his Redeemer lives. It was in the environment of being at the lowest point when God showed him, I have not forsaken you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. It is when other people are gone and even his relatives have nothing to do with him. Let's read the rest. It says, I called my servant, verse 16, and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth, but he didn't answer. Verse 17, my breath is strange to my wife. That's humorous, isn't it? The way it's written, my breath is strange to my wife. My wife doesn't want to talk to me. She's, she's not here. And it is here when Job finds, and the Holy Spirit does this. He, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's affected by the Holy Spirit. And he says this. I know people have forsaken me, but I know my Redeemer lives, and he will stand on the latter day. He prophesies, and this portion of Scripture is so instructive because we're all interested in the world to come. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We're interested to know. 
And here we have detail. Look at it, verse 26. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Wait a minute. Read that again. I know that worms will eat my body in the grave, but I also know that flesh will be raised up and I will see God and I will be in the flesh glorified. What amazing insight. And again, the context is nobody cares about me. Nobody's talking to me. Nobody is my friend. Even the people that are the closest to me are far away from me. But then this is what, when God did his great visitation. His great visitation came in the darkness. It came in a world of disconnected living. It was that maybe the brokenness of Job and the comforting of the Holy Spirit and the revelation, the prophecy of his future that his plight would only be in time and it would pass and that he would see God in the flesh. Do you realize that you will see God in your flesh and when you see him, you shall be like him? Do you realize that there's nothing in this world that is greater than the Christ that saved us, that he became a man forever? Do you realize that there's nothing that can separate you from his love in Romans chapter 8? Not death, not life, not things present, not things past, things to come. Nothing can by any means separate us from him. Do you see what's happening here in our diagram of the, of the house, you know, with the two floors? and the first floor and the second floor? And do you realize that, um, that this first floor living is a painful one at times? Where are my friends? Where is my wife? Where are my children? Where are my servants? Where are my brethren? Where are my inward friends he has here? It's a verse um, 18. Yea, young children despised me. I arose and they spake against me. And then 19, all my inward friends abhorred me. Inward friends, the closest ones, abhorred me. They whom I have loved have turned against me. You realize that this, this whole house that we've taught about quite a bit in our, in our church here, this whole house is a real house. That it's the Holy Spirit speaking to Job and giving him hope, confidence, truth in the inward man. Do you realize that Job is like changed because of this? And that he realizes that the pain that I have in this world isn't really, cannot keep me down. Actually, I wish now that my words were engraven in stone because I know and we can emphasize it. I know my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand in the latter days upon this earth. And though the worms will eat my body, I know that in my flesh I shall see God. Verse 27. Whom I shall see for myself, my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. That means, that phrase, though my reins be consumed in me, is an important portion. That even though emotionally I am, the reins are the kidneys, on the top of the kidneys are the adrenal glands, and they shoot the hormone adrenaline into our bloodstream. And the ancient world, they didn't have psychology terminology like we, but they knew very well many aspects of bodily anatomy, and they associated the kidneys with our emotions, and that's the ancient word for our emotion. And though my reins are consuming me, 
That means that I'm very emotional. That means that even I, I'm very disappointed with the people around me, the lack of sympathy, compassion, and care, the sense of alienation and loneliness and desolation. But that being what it is, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I also know that even though I'm very emotional and maybe we could say exhausted, and even on the border of a breakdown, I know I shall see him, God. My eyes will see him. I am sure of my salvation. I am sure that God's grace is sufficient for me. I am sure he will visit me in my dark times. I am sure he will quicken me, though in my flesh I feel my weakness, Romans 8, 11, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead shall also quicken my mortal body. I know this. It is amazing. This is like a finished work declaration in a dark chapter. And that's like God to us. Let's finish up here. I've been thinking a lot about how, how discouraging, how people can get so discouraged in life. I've been thinking about, um, I've been looking for the dark chapters. I've been thinking about reality, like reality is reality. I hear bad news sometimes. I heard four powerful uh, bad news uh, um, messages in one short time. And I have a lot of, uh, I, I can't, it's even beyond words. You cannot even talk about it, what can happen in this world. But I also know this is what Job said. I believe this about us. That even, even when you are facing the fiery trial of your life, 1 Peter 4.12, he said, don't be surprised for that fiery trial. And know this, that his grace is sufficient. God is with us. God cares about us. God has been there. God has been here. He has lived through it. God has shown us a way, not of, a, of a, a perfect life. He was perfect, but he didn't tell us in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as my Father in heaven. But he didn't suggest to us that we would be perfect, but he did say that he would be with us, that his grace would be sufficient that his spirit would lead us, that his spirit would comfort us, his spirit would never fail us, and his spirit would lead us in godliness, in faith, and in this amazing sense of grace. God's grace is with us. And it was with Job when he said this. This was grace ministered to Job. So this is great. Now the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, after you have suffered a while, strengthen and settle you. Getting settled in him and knowing him. Okay, here's a two, two applications, I think. Well, number one, a mother this summer with little children, four, five, six, seven years old, a mother with children this summer here in the church and in Baltimore, living in Baltimore City, a mother, being a mother, learning to be a mother. The older women teach the younger women how to take care, how to raise children, how to be a mother. Titus 2, verse 4. What is the answer? I think you know, but I think about it. And I made a short list yesterday. And I said, that's a good message. Someday I'll preach it. I'm not doing it now. A mother, a beautiful attitude, a spiritual mind, 
a life of faith and a lot of love. And I know there are so many mothers that are doing such a great job in learning. And you're leading your children in the faith. You're leading them in the Sunday school, in the schools and programs and so on. It's beautiful. Mother. Um, and then the suffering, and not the mother suffering, who I think she does a lot, but the suffering of Job. The suffering of Job. The suffering that happens. And then lastly, 27. I will see for myself, but you should say, why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Job is saying, my problems, you're talking to me, but you're not hitting the target. The problems you're talking about are in you, but they are not in me. This is what he's saying. You know, a lot of people do a lot of talking, but they haven't hit the utterances. Ephesians 6, 9, 18 and 19. Pray for me that I would have, that I would speak as I ought to. This is what Paul said, and we say it with each other. Pray for the mothers that they would speak as they ought to. Pray for the dads that they would speak as they ought to. Pray for the outreaches during the summer as we think about it. Pray and that the Holy Spirit will visit us and we would, we would say things that would edify us and we would not feel the alienation. There are people that are in crowds and they're very alone. Some of the loneliest people in the world are in New York City. I mean, so, you know, we can say that by way of a, uh, you know, to illustrate it. I don't know empirically that that's true, but you understand what I mean. I mean, even in this church, I could sit in the church and feel the alienation. But I must learn what Job was learning. Wait a minute. Nobody cares about me, but I know my Redeemer liveth. I know that this is only for a period of time. I know the nature of this God. I know that even if in my, my reins are consuming me, but I know that in my flesh, somehow it was great comfort to him. And when it comes through the Holy Spirit, it goes deep into your heart. And this is where I would love it if the young people and all of us and the missionaries that are coming here from far away, as Pastor Toll was sharing with me the last night, and he just said this was an amazing time. And I know that, that this is what body life is. It's not just canned speeches or messages. It is so much deeper. It is this type of life. Job is beat up, and he's in a lot of trouble in his soul. And the Holy Spirit shows him, and he just changes. And he said, I wish everybody could read what I'm about to say. I understand my Redeemer. He is the one that cares about me. He is the essence of my life. He is my salvation. He is the comforter of my soul. He is the reality that I am looking for. He is the one that will never leave me or forsake me. Here's another last thing. Maybe it is, but you know how it is. Okay. Um, man and a woman, man and woman married many, many years. Many years. One of them passes. The other one, they're alone. They go to an empty house. They, they have to readjust. They, many tears at night in the pillow. And their partner, their mate for life is gone. That's amazing. That's not a small thing. But it cannot destroy me. That experience cannot take away from me my life. That cannot, that cannot, that cannot, uh, chew me up and spit me out. That loss of my partner cannot determine for me my future. 
if you are following me. What is? I believe there's a cross. I believe the cross means a death to myself, and I believe in a resurrection. I believe that Job is saying, everybody, I am so disappointed, I am not connected with anybody, but I know who, I know who I am connected with, and I know that he is enough. I know he is the Alpha and the Omega. I know he is the answer for me. And if you're one of the single folks and you're saying you're having a hard time, I understand you have a hard time, but I also believe there is a cross. And you cannot have a single life destroy your life. Your life is bigger than that. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know he's going to take care of me. I know he's going to lead me and guide me all the way. I know he will visit me in the night. I know he will come upon me in his presence and give me peace. I know that he'll speak to my heart. I know he'll give me a good friend who will give utterances to me and comfort. And not natural words and just blah, 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 talking. That's part of life. Shallow talk conversations is part of life and I'm not against it. But do you have a word from God? Do you have a word from God? Do you have a word that will build me up? Do you have an answer from God? Do you have a word from the Holy Spirit? And this is the meaning. Pray for me that I would speak as I ought to and make known the mysteries of Christ. Our Christ cannot be too small. Our Christ cannot be just somebody you put in your pocket and pull out any once in a while, and he's not, not enough for you. Christ must be the Alpha and the Omega. He is. And Job is saying in this chapter, in the context, exactly what we've said a number of times tonight, and I think you got it, and we got it across by repeating it these many times. Nobody can destroy you. Christ is with you. No loss can be too great that it will bury you. I know my Redeemer liveth. And in that statement is packed with something that is a mystery. How could I be so satisfied having lost so much? But it must be that Christ is our provision and he's enough. Get out of your pettiness. Get out of your selfish little world. Get out of your own stuff and just leave it and don't care so much about it. You think too much about it. You're too occupied with what you have lost. You're too occupied with the fear of losing what you have. Go to the cross, let it be what it is, and let God determine for you your footsteps. Let God determine for you your life and the content of that life. Let God be your life and and pray that God will give utterances that will break through the garbage that is in everyday life and speak to me and the truth will set me free and I shall be free indeed. Amazing. Beautiful. We're going to have a prayer, but before, we've got some cafe cards to give out before we close. Charity Simpkins, is she here? Kevin Kennedy, is he here? I think he's over here. Kevin Kennedy, come on up. Woody Pittman, right here. And Ed Vich from uh, Thailand, from France. There you go. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Kevin. There you go, sir. Thank you. Here's Ed Vich. Love you. Charity. There you go. God bless you. Okay, would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this service tonight. Oh, God. Thank you. Please help us, lead us. Thank you for it. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for your nature and your person. If you're here for tonight and you don't have Jesus in your life, 
here tonight, you don't have Christ in your life. You don't, you're not saved. You don't know much about it at all. You maybe don't want God, don't care about it, don't even think about it. Now, I hardly have a thought about him. But tonight you do. And tonight he's calling you. You say, come to me. I care about you. Say, I believe in you, Jesus. Raise your hand here tonight, anyone at all. I believe in you, Jesus, anyone. On the internet, please say that prayer. Believe in you, Jesus. I believe in you. And then, Father, for our summer, our guidance, we pray every day that utterances would be given to us, the whole body, everybody, all of us, would, would, would have the word in, in the Holy Spirit that leads us in our new life of faith. Bless this church this way and through all the month of June and July and bless those mothers Lord and dads and lead us with this definition in Christ's name Amen <laughs>